Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, divine physician, who in your earthly life showed special concern for those who suffer, and entrusted to your disciples the ministry of healing, made us ever ready to alleviate the trials of our brothers and sisters. Make each one of us aware of the great mission that is entrusted to us. Strive always to be in the performance of daily service, an instrument of your merciful love. Enlighten our minds, guide our hands, make our hearts diligent and compassionate. Ensure that in every patient we know how to discern the features of your divine face. You who are the way, provide us with the gift of knowing how to imitate you every day as medical doctors, not only of the body, but of the whole person, helping those who are sick to tread with trust <coughs> their own earthly path until the moment of their encounter with you. You who are the truth, provide us with the gift of wisdom and experience in order to penetrate the mystery of humanity and our transcendent destiny as we draw near to God in order to discover the cause of all illness and find suitable remedies for them. You who are the light, provide us with the gift of preaching and very much the gospel of life in our profession, committing ourselves to defending always from being set free to its natural end and to respect the dignity of every human being and especially, especially the dignity of the weakest and the most in need. Make us, O oh Lord, good Samaritans, ready to welcome, treat, and console those we encounter in our work. From the example of the holy medical doctors that preceded us, help us to offer our generous contribution to the constant renewal of healthcare structures. Bless our studies and our profession, enlighten our research and our teaching. Lastly, grant to us, having constantly loved and served you in our suffering brothers and sisters, that at the end of our earthly pilgrimage, we may contemplate your glorious countenance and experience the joy of the encounter with you in your kingdom of everlasting peace. Amen. <laughs>
effectively, um, what I've done is come up with a theory as to how matter behaved once it had been created. And how the world got here is properly the domain of metaphysics, the, the, the philosophy of being, and theology. And science, um, he didn't think, would be able to explain that. And I don't, I don't logically, I don't think it can really. In the, the scriptures, in Genesis, we see that um, God made the world in seven days. And of course, this is allegorical language. Um, but um, uh, during that time as well, he created man and woman, Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. And he set them to live in an earthly paradise, the Garden of Eden. And he gave them dominion over nature. There was no suffering there. Um, and they lived in, in uh, deep intimacy with God. And he placed only one restriction on their freedom, and that was that they weren't to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the centre of the garden. Uh, but they were tempted by Satan. And it's interesting what he said to them, you will become like God and you will know good and evil, so that they would be able to decide for themselves what was good and what was evil, rather than having reference to God. And of course, there are very clear echoes of that. There always have been echoes of that throughout history, but today especially, is a, is a strong emphasis on autonomy and we decide for ourselves what um, morality is without reference to any absolute values. Um, anyway, they did it, the fruit, as we know, and at that point, creation changed. Creation was damaged and um, a war and suffering and famine and discord, uh, the pains of childbirth, uh, the sweat and toil of work, all those things came into to being at that time. But there's some very good news there at the beginning because in Genesis we see God addressing Satan uh, in what's called the, the Proto-Evangelium or the first gospel and telling him that um, he will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall crush your head. So we have reference to a mysterious woman and her offspring. Um, and then throughout the centuries of the, or thousands of years um, of the Old Testament, a Messiah is repeatedly prefigured and foretold until eventually this child is born in Bethlehem, <clears throat> about 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem in uh, Judea. His conception was miraculous under the power of the Holy Spirit. His mother, Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, remained ever a virgin. On earth, she had a, a, a husband, St. Joseph, who became the foster father of Jesus, and together they raised him in obscurity in um, Nazareth, in Galilee. He led an unspectacular life. Uh, he learned a trade from his father, we think, um, probably a, a carpenter, a general tradesman, until at the age of 30, he burst onto the scene as a very radical preacher and said the most extraordinary things. Um, and his, his claim was that he was the son of God, God himself, God made man. And you notice here he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not that you won't keep God's commandments, you'll keep my commandments, because he was in fact God. That, that was his claim. And that cost him dearly, as we know. He was crucified for making those claims. And St Paul tells us that um, uh, he was obedient unto death on a cross. He was obeying the will of his Father in heaven. And we're, of course, called to do the same thing. And there may be suffering entailed in that. You know, keeping the commandments, following the teachings of the church may entail some suffering for us. It's not going to be dramatic suffering all the time, hopefully. But especially in our chosen uh, vocations of, um, of health care, um, there may be times when we feel up against it. We may sometimes be marginalised and... Uh, uh, you know, we could be passed over a promotion and things like that. Those things aren't so common and we shouldn't get it out of perspective, but they, they are possibilities. Those are the crosses which we may be asked to carry. Um, after three days in the tomb, um, he was raised from the dead under his own power. That's the central point of our belief. And as St Paul says, um, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then this is all a waste of time and we could go home today and do other things so um, the th this is because we believe he was uh, the son of God God incarnate <clears throat> God having taken human nature it turns out that <clears throat> that baby that adorable baby that was born in Bethlehem is actually God himself and it, it's a you know it's a mind-boggling thing that we could actually take him in our arms and sing lullabies to him um, it's that's how close God has come to us that's how intimate he wants to be with us 
And I mention this because I think we have to rid ourselves of any idea that we have, you know, God is far away in heaven, just waiting to cast down thunderbolts and to catch us out and trip us up in what we're doing. He's here, he, he, you know, what he desires is our happiness. And so he's given us the means to achieve that in this life and, of course, eternally in heaven afterwards. Um, he, on earth, he founded his church with St. Peter as the head and he told us that he couldn't reveal everything about himself because it would be too much for us. But he would send the Holy Spirit, which he did in the fullness of time. And over the past 2,000 years or so, the Holy Spirit has been guiding the church. And so the popes and the saints and the you know, holy men and women of the church um, have been uh, expounding scripture. And, um, uh, and when we hear what we call magisterial teaching from the church, we are actually hearing the voice of Jesus Christ. We can be confident of that. Um, now, I, I don't want to be giving sermons, it's not my job to give a sermon, but just to say that, you know, in, the, in, in our chosen game, where we may have struggles, uh, we, we have to have recourse to the means that, are, that, that God has given to us. And the sacraments, of course, there are seven sacraments for different stages of life and states in life. But the Eucharist and the Sacrament of Reconciliation are available to us all the time. Remember that Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. And we need the life of Jesus Christ in us to cope with what we are facing, you know, the difficulties we might face. And then with confession, it's not, you know, hopefully it's not that we're, you know, running off to commit to uh, confess grave sins all the time but we do receive a grace when we go to confession a grace for the struggle and so those are very important things that we um, need to have access to a good exemplar for us would be um, st thomas more a good intercessor because as we know he was um, for what he believed he was martyred now we're not going to be martyred <laughs> hopefully um, but there may be small martyrdoms there may be times you know when we it's frosty in the coffee room or we, you know, we, we're ostracized. Perhaps we will find it difficult to be promoted at times and so on. Um, as I said, you know, we, I don't want to give you the idea and you probably discovered yourselves. It doesn't happen all the time. It's a possibility. It may happen sometimes. Um, but the interesting thing about St. Thomas More is he didn't throw himself at martyrdom. He wasn't running headlong into martyrdom. He didn't want martyrdom. It was only when he, he found himself absolutely compromised um, that he actually um, uh, accepted that fate. Well, I'd like to just play a very quick clip from the film a Man for All Seasons, if you haven't seen it, you know, it's about the life um, and the death of Thomas More, about his martyrdom. Um, and, it, you know, just as a freestanding thing, as a film, it's a wonderful film, but it has a very poignant message for us. So in this scene, his daughter informs uh, St Thomas that, um, he, that the, an oath will have to be taken, the oath of succession, in which he would have to sign up to things which would go against the faith. Um, and so he... Um, this is what happens. Father! Margaret! I couldn't get a boat. What is it, Meg? Father, there's a new act going through Parliament. Oh? By this act, they're going to administer an oath about the marriage. On what compulsion is the oath? High treason. But what is the wording? What do the words matter? We know what it will mean. You mean what the words say. An oath is made of words. It may be possible to take it. Take it? Yes, and if it can be taken, you must take it too. No! Listen, Meg. God made the angels to show him splendor, as he made animals for innocence and plants for their simplicity. But man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. If he suffers us to come to such a case that there is no escaping, then we may stand to our tackle as best we can. And yes, Meg, then we can clamor like champions if we have the spittle for it. But it's God's part, not our own, to bring ourselves to such a pass. Our natural business lies in escaping. If I can take this oath, I will. Okay, so he says that if I can take this oath, I will. And the next scene is St. Thomas in the Tower of London. He found he couldn't take the oath. And so he, he stood to, to his, uh, uh, by his um, principles and, and was martyred. 
Um, but it's interesting what he says there. He's telling us that we need to use our wits, uh, that our usual business is escape. So we're not throwing ourselves at tribunals and attracting complaints and that type of thing. As far as possible, we want to stay employed and do all the good that we could do in our professions in a long uh, and fruitful career. One thing I would warn about is the idea of fundamentalism. Um, really, this is, we could say this is the, the, the too literal interpretation of scripture. Um, one of the things that magisterial teaching does for us is interpret um, uh, scripture so that, you know, you or I may sit down and meditate on the gospel and we could come up with insights and uh, lights for our um, relationship with God. But the overarching mean of, of scripture is interpreted for us by the church. And um, so we have to be careful not to just um, interpret things in a purely literal way. So if we take an example of the fifth commandment, um, thou shalt not kill, which, you know, it sounds very common sense. We don't want to be killing each other. Um, but does that mean we can never kill at all? Well, you know, I'm sure uh, the, the people that went off to defend this country and, you know, other countries that you're maybe from, uh, in un wars of, of aggression, in other words, we were attacked unjustly. The soldiers that went off to fight and kill enemy soldiers, they weren't murdering people at the time. They, they, were, they were actually committing acts of self-defense, which is a different thing. And so we need to be careful. We need to, um, uh, we need to use ethics. Ethics is all about understanding um, scripture properly, understanding the teachings of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit over those thousands of years has been influencing people to use both um, theological study and using their reason as well to come to a proper understanding of how we can live in a complicated world. Of course, God knows this world is complicated. Um, if we were to take a very fundamentalist view, we could say, well, there's a copy of the Ten Commandments, there's a copy of the Beatitudes of Jesus Christ, um, and, you know, go away and get on with it. And, of course, everything is contained there, in essence, but actually applying those things in the, in the, the fray of um, an increasingly complicated world needs a bit more discernment. The other thing to be aware of is what's called consequentialism. That's... Um, an English word first coined by Elizabeth Anscombe, after whom the Anscombe Centre for Bioethics is named. And really what she was getting at here, what she meant by consequentialism, is the idea that if you want to produce a, a good outcome, a good moral outcome, um, you, have to take, you have to beware of the stages, of the steps along the way to producing that good outcome. So there's, there's a quite a popular belief that um, ends... Uh, that means do justify ends. In other words, if we want a good outcome, it doesn't really matter how we get there, provided we do get there. Well, that's really diametrically opposed to Catholic teaching, which tells us that all of our actions have to be good in themselves. Either they've got to be morally neutral or they've got to be good in themselves. <clears throat> and um, so to take a, a very dramatic example, um, we, we need to know what our... What our um, what our actions are actually, what is the moral implication of our actions as well. So, um, and, and, and be, be, be fully aware of what all the consequences may be. Um, so if we think back to the Second World War again, the, uh, the war in Europe was over by May of that year, but it dragged on in the Pacific and they were still fighting there in August. And then the Americans took the decision to use an atomic weapon for the first time. So on the 6th of August, um, a bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and then three days later on Nagasaki. And by the middle of um, August, the Japanese had surrendered, and then by the beginning of September, it was all signed and sealed, and the Second World War came to an abrupt close. And nobody could deny that that is a good outcome. You know, who would not wish the Second World War to come to an end? However, it has to be said that in the process around about 200,000 um, innocent civilians died. Uh, and so that's not really conscionable. I don't think you would find many ethicists who would try to, to justify that these days. So that's a clear example of consequentialism. So how do we actually know that we are doing good? Um, as I said, you know, just the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes wouldn't necessarily give us all the information we need. Um, and... Um, uh, so we have a system, the church has a system to help us to understand 
whether what we're doing is actually morally good or not. So we're going to talk about three different areas today, um, which are fairly basic, it's fairly basic stuff, but it should equip us for the rest of the day. Right, so what we, we refer to, first of all, is what's called the sources of morality. And we thank St Thomas Aquinas for this, a great Dominican uh, 13th century preacher, theologian, philosopher, and much of the, um, uh, you know, the teaching of the church today is still based on his work. Um, and, and where Father John is, the rector of Allen Hall, I'm sure they've got it coming out of their ears down there. But, uh, um, but we're just going to use some very simple extracts from it. So first of all, we look at the sources of morality. And for that, we have to look at three things. First of all, the, the, the object or the moral object. What am I doing from a moral point of view? What my intention is, whether that's good or bad, and what the circumstances are, because they can, they can alter uh, moral gravity. So we don't just want a purely physical description of what we're doing. Um, now, if I was going to say pull a lever, uh, a simple physical explanation would be that I will, I will reach up with my right hand, I'll clasp the handle, and I will pull the lever down through 90 degrees. But what happens if that lever happens to be on that aeroplane over Japan, and when I pull the lever, the bomb is released, and, and all those people die? Um, so we need to know what the moral significance of our actions is. Um, and then the intention. The intention has to be good in itself. Why am I doing this? And then the circumstances, such as, you know, where, with who, and all those things can, can influence uh, the, the moral uh, um, species of what we're doing. So to take an example. If I decide I'm going to give some money to charity, what is my moral object there? OK, well, I want to donate money to the poor, which is good in itself. Uh, my intention is to relieve hunger and suffering. Well, clearly, that's good. Nobody could argue with that. Um, and the circumstances are good because I'm using honest money. I'm not depriving my family of um, housekeeping money, whatever it is. So that would qualify as a morally good action. But what if the intention and the circumstances are changed? So. First of all, the intention. So the moral object remains good, giving money to the poor. But my intention on this occasion is that I want to attract attention to myself. I want to attract, attract praise, which is fundamentally wrong, evil. Um, the circumstances are still good because it's on its money. But the intention renders the action immoral. So um, clearly good would be done. The poor would receive the money. Hunger and suffering would be relieved to some extent. But I've introduced um, an element of evil there. So that wouldn't be acceptable. And then um, if we change the circumstances, uh, if I'm using stolen cash, then um, clearly I've, done, I've stolen, I've broken a commandment, I've stolen along the way to achieve that. And, you know, it doesn't matter how much of a, a Robin Hood I might fancy myself. If, um, uh, if, if I've done that, then I've rendered the whole thing immoral. So we have to be, we have to be careful um, when we perform an action which has a moral significance to it. And then coming closer to home, the example of abortion. <laughs> um, so it's taking the life of an innocent person. So... Remember, we believe from a theological and philosophical as well as scientific perspective that um, uh, life begins at conception. So we can't alter that. That's fundamentally immoral. Supposing in this particular circumstances, the, the, um, this particular case, that the gynaecologist, out of a sense of compassion, wants to relieve poverty. So maybe it's a woman with two small children already. Um, and uh, she's living in squalor on benefits, and her husband has left, and she has a third baby on the way, and the gynaecologist feels that he or she can relieve that poverty by, um, by performing an abortion, and it may relieve the poverty to some extent. Um, that intention, as a freestanding intention, is good in itself, and the circumstances are that this is a competent surgeon, it's a clean operating suite and all those things. However, nothing, neither the intention nor the circumstances can alter the fact that this is a fundamentally evil action. Now, the next thing to look at is um, cooperation in evil, or rather avoiding cooperation in evil. And we, um, 
it may or may not surprise you to hear that we cooperate in evil all the time. Um, so if we have a, a Netflix uh, subscription or a BBC license, then we'll find ourselves watching some very good programs, uh, you know, films and drama and so on. But also there will be harmful stuff in there as well. And some of it may be frankly pornographic, um, but somehow we'd still spend money on these things. When we pay our taxes, there's always a chance that um, there's going to be that some of it may be used for funding questionable wars, for example. Certainly some of it will go to funding abortion. And um, when we, we like to buy nice clothes and gadgets and that type of thing, and we know that these things are sometimes produced in countries where the workers' conditions are poor, but somehow we still do it. So how can that be justified or can it be justified and to what extent? Um, well, just going back to scripture for a moment, and I won't attempt to be a theologian, but it is uh, clear that twice in St. Matthew's Gospel, um, on occasions quite close to each other, that um, Jesus Christ is asked about paying taxes. Um, and he does use it. He uses the occasion for a catechesis um, because, you know, the Pharisees are being crafty with him. But... He doesn't stamp his feet and say that we mustn't pay taxes. So here we have, this is, you know, God incarnate is, is not um, proscribing this for us. Um, other things he did stamp his feet about, as we know, but not this. So, and, you know, it's really, I think, showing us there are certain things that we can't change. And, uh, and our contribution to those uh, evil things, if they are evil, may be very small. And really, that's what trying to do in medicines to make sure our contribution to any evil is negligible, even though it may still uh, exist. Um, so let's um, look at a general scheme, first of all, of how we analyse our level of cooperation. So this is a bit of a dry looking scheme to begin with, but then we'll go on to um, a clinical example to flesh it out. So let's say a person who has free will, is fully compass mentis, decides that they're going to commit um, an evil action and um, they are responsible for their own actions and nothing can alter their culpability. But other people may find themselves involved at various stages along the way. So that has to be divided up into formal and material cooperation. The distinguishing thing about formal cooperation is that the intention is shared. So somebody, so somebody helping this person to commit an evil action is quite happy for it to be to be uh, to be happening, and and uh, doesn't have any uh, conscience about it. So we have to avoid that at all costs because the moral gravity of what do, what we're doing in that situation is roughly equivalent to doing it ourselves. And the material the intention is not shared. Somehow we're still involved at some level, but we don't actually particularly want this evil thing to happen. And the all important question really is whether our contribution um, is helping this evil action to happen. Could it happen without my cooperation? Right, so material cooperation is broken up into direct, which is too close for comfort, which you'll see in a moment, and then indirect, And that's divided up into proximate and remote. Generally speaking, proximate will be, um, it's not a good idea, uh, and remote uh, may very well be. And in that space between the two, conscience comes into play. Well, this would be a very good point to make, to say something about conscience, because it's often misunderstood. Um, Conscience is not something that we arrive with ready programmed. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function of our intellect, but it requires correct information in order to function properly. So we know that if we're, we're undertaking a particular course of action which may be immoral, then we have a sense of unease about it. Conversely, if we think it's okay, if we understand it to be okay, we will, would you know, feel serene about that. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's in computing, but there's a term used in computing, GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, really what this is saying, that if, you, you know, if you're operating a, a computer model and you give it the wrong information, give it false or inaccurate data, then you'll get a nonsense answer. And the same applies to our conscience. So if you think, for example, of, of a small child who 
um, from a small age, perhaps, with, from a young age, was, was uh, taught that lying and stealing are OK, then he won't have a sense of unease when he lies or steals. And that will be carried through to adulthood unless somebody reprograms his conscience. So our conscience has to be properly formed. Now, going back to that example, <coughs> to a clinical example, so an evil action is going to be performed by um, uh, an obstetrician gynaecologist. Um, they're going to perform an abortion. For whatever reason, they've arrived at this decision, but they're going to do it, um, and they are fully culpable for that. Other people will be involved, so with formal cooperation, an example would be the assistant who scrubs up and helps him to, or her to perform that operation. And um, so the, they're quite happy for the abortion to happen. Um, and they, they stand there handing instruments to the gynaecologist. And that's just like somebody handing bullets to an assassin. Um, that's the sort of level we're at there. Um, so that has to be avoided at all costs. So to anybody that does work in theatre, then I would you know, strongly recommend that you that um, you have a look at that. I'm not suggesting for a moment anybody is doing this, but sometimes you can be co coerced into it, and it's and that's that's the that's how serious it is. And then with um, material cooperation, again that question: Could this evil action happen without my cooperation? So, uh, if it's direct, an example there would be the anaesthetist. Now, the anaesthetist is not performing the abortion and he or she may uh, soothe their conscience by saying, well, I'm not actually doing the operation. It's not me. All I'm doing is, is giving an anaesthetic. Well, of course, that's a purely physical description of what he's doing. But a moral analysis shows that he's actually facilitating the abortion, which couldn't happen without the assistance of an anaesthetist. So that's a, a red flag for anybody that may be going into anaesthetics. And then um, with indirect material cooperation, looking first of all at proximate. Uh, a good example there would be the hospital porter who transports the patient down to the operating theatre and, and lifts her onto the table. And very clearly, the operation couldn't happen without his um, assistance. And he may be, have no interest in abortion whatsoever, certainly doing nothing clinical, but somehow he finds himself caught up in it. And, and so that's, uh, that's something to be avoided as well. And then with remote cooperation, an example could be the domestic staff who clean the operating theatre. Um, so remember that this is, um, you know, most likely in an NHS setting where this theatre will be used for other good things as well as the abortions. And it's certainly not in anybody's interest to have a dirty operating theatre. And so to clean it in, and not be actually involved in, in the process of the abortion itself I think you'd find most ethicists would agree that's that's um, OK. Um, of course, the, the, the gold standard would be just to walk away and not work in that area at all, work in another area of the hospital. That may not be possible. And other things would be brought into the picture, like, you know, is this a very poor person with mouths to feed? But that is an example of material, indirect, remote cooperation. And that's where we're trying to get to. You know, in all that we do, we're trying to make any cooperation Hopefully, much of the time, we won't be cooperating at all. But if we are, to get it as far away from the uh, uh, actual action itself. So it's got to be material, indirect, <clears throat> and remote. And then, of course, conscience doesn't come into play. And conscience is always paramount. So people have to, you know, having weighed the uh, various factors, then conscience has to be uh, accepted. And then finally, the principle of double effect. So with the principle of double effect, it's difficult to practice medicine at all or, or healthcare at all without using the principle of double effect because what is the principle of double effect? It's like situations where we're doing something which is fundamentally good to produce a good outcome, and, and it does produce a good outcome, but along the way, there's a foreseen but unintended evil effect. So, for example, we give chemotherapy for the treatment of, say, acute leukaemia, when there may be a high chance of a cure, but also very unpleasant side effects, which are inevitable, such as hair loss, extreme nausea and vomiting, serious infections as a result of neutropenia, etc. But we still do it in pursuit of a higher goal of a medical cure. So how do we justify doing that? Okay, so there are four conditions that have to be satisfied 
First of all, the action that we perform, the medical procedure or the drug that we give, mustn't be evil in and of itself. Um, and the unintended evil, which we know will arise, mustn't be a means to the good effect. We'll, we'll flesh this out with an example in a minute. Um, and the evil effect mustn't be intended. We don't want the evil effect to happen. It's just unavoidable. And then there has to be a proportionate reason for allowing the evil thing to happen. So first we'll look at the example of self-defence. So if we imagine that our country, um, or any country, has been attacked by an unjust aggressor, we didn't provoke the war, but this um, evil power has attacked our country, um, is killing our uh, civilians, um, and life and liberty are um, at risk, then how would we apply that in that situation? So if we imagine that in that country, in the attacking country, there is a, a chemical weapons plant and um, we have pretty good intelligence that they're going to use these chemical weapons on us. So the decision is taken to blow up the plant and uh, in the knowledge that there's a town nearby and there will be some civilian deaths, some civilian casualties. So how could we justify that? Can we justify that? So applying those four principles, first of all, the act must be good in and of itself. Well, the action here is self-defence. This is where it's important to get the moral analysis. The action itself is self-defence, which, we, which we're obliged to, to undertake, both for ourselves and others. Um, and then the unintended evil effect mustn't be a means to the good effect. So the fact that these poor civilians are going to die mustn't be the, the route by which the, the chemical plant is um, destroyed. And then the, the evil effect mustn't be intended. We certainly don't want the civilians to die. And the, there must be a proportionate reason for allowing that evil effect. And the defence of a, of a nation could be justified in those terms. I think most ethicists would, would agree with that. Um, right. So and now if we look at something, uh, something closer to home. So we're going to look at the example of um, a, a lady with a uterine carcinoma during pregnancy. I have to be very careful because we have an illustrious gynaecologist here today. <laughs> And from Scotland, they don't take prisoners up there. So. <laughs> but um, so I'm only talking in very general terms. And I should say also, uh, there is a government health warning on me because I'm retired. So I'm not giving clinical lectures today. I'm not qualified to do that. So I'm only talking in general terms. So, um, so this is a lady. She's um, say 18 weeks pregnant. Unheard of for um, a baby to survive outside of the womb at that point, and she's developed a uterine carcinoma. And so the management decision uh, in this non-viable fetus is to do a hysterectomy. Um, can we justify that, knowing doing this operation in full knowledge that the baby will die? And it's, just, it's a tragic, complicated. Um, heart-rending situation, one of those things which Jesus Christ foresaw, and that's why he's influenced us with the Holy Spirit to develop ethics. Um, so a moral analysis of that. Is the act evil in itself? Um, well, no, it's not evil to remove a diseased organ. In fact, you know, we have an obligation to do that with consent. Um, is the evil effect a means to the good? And it's not, the death of the baby, the tragic death of the baby, is not the means by which the cancer is treated. And is the evil effect intended? Well, it's certainly not. Let's say this gynaecologist is not in the habit of performing random abortions. And the mother, you know, she may be very pro-life and she wouldn't dream of contemplating abortion normally. Um, so it's not an intended consequence. Uh, consequence. And then finally, uh, is there a proportionate reason for allowing the evil effect? And so it's a situation where we're trying to save the mother's life, where we know from experience that it would be impossible to save both lives. So we're, we're electing to save the mother's life in those very difficult circumstances. So um, there is, of course, there's another possible course of action, which would be heroic. And the mother might choose, and you know, certainly women have done this, uh, might choose to continue with the pregnancy until the point of an agreed level of viability or, um, would be arrived at, and then the baby delivered, and by which time the, the, the tumour may have extended and the mother's life may be in jeopardy. So that was, I mean, that's an example of um, heroic virtue, heroic sanctity, really. You know, I, I would think that a woman who um, 
who made that choice will probably go straight to heaven. Not for me to say, but that is, you know, laying down one's life for a friend is a clear um, principle from the gospel. So those are the principles. I'm sorry if that was a bit, uh, if that's given you indigestion, but um, those are the sort of things that we want to see applied during the day. We're going to be hearing from other consultants uh, in specialities, and uh, these are some of the main principles that we'll be needing for that. Um, and then I've just finally emphasised once again that we're, uh, the, the idea of a day like this is so that we can understand properly what we're doing from a moral perspective and try to find ways around the difficulties that will arise.